Good evening, everyone. We are live here right now. And I just want to um, do a little um, housekeeping here before we get started. And that is to make sure um, that you mute yourselves. Um, I will be taking attendance. So when, when I get ready to take attendance, you can unmute yourself. But please be very careful of um, any background um, conversations that may be going on, okay? All right, it was a beautiful day today, wasn't it? I thought it was. So right now I'm gonna say good evening and welcome to the Audit and Finance Committee 2021 Agency Budgets Review. Um, the, I'll say this department heads, you will be asked a series of questions related to your budget and are expected to answer as completely as you can. If an answer to our questions cannot be provided at this time, then please indicate when you are able to provide it to the committee. Legislators have been provided with written responses to our budget information request letter. And we, and we wanna thank you uh, for your cooperation in providing that. However, in order to complete a more thorough examination of the budget, it may be necessary to forward you some additional questions after tonight's hearing. So tonight I would like to um, welcome um, in this order aging, uh, Ms. Deborah Tano, uh, mental health, Dr. Giordano, health, Dr. Whalen, and uh, nursing home, Mr. Slatsky. I'm going to take attendance now. And I will start with Mr. Peter. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman, I am present. Mr. Bergdorf. Present, ma'am. Yes. Mr. Clay. Here. Mr. Grimm. Here. Uh, Mr. Joyce. Present. All right, it's good to see you back, Ray. Ms. Lukakis. Here. Mr. Mayo. Here. And Mr. O'Brien. Here. How are you doing this evening? Great. All right. Mr. Beston. Here. Mr. Bruski. Ms. Chapman. Here. Mr. Cleary. Mr. Comiso. Ms. Cunningham. Mr. Demolowitz. Mr. Drake. Mr. Epicoro? Yeah. Mr. Ethier. Mr. Fine? Here. Uh, Mr. Andrew Joyce. Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Langdon? Here. Ms. Lockhart? Mr. Moriello. Here. Ms. McLean Lane. Here, Madam Chair. Ms. McLaughlin. Here. Mr. Miller. Here. Mr. Purley. Ms. Splotsky. Here, Madam Chair. Mr. Reedy. Here. Mr. Reinhardt. Mr. Ricard. Present, present, Madam Chair. Mr. Simpson. Here. Mr. Smith. Mr. Tunney. Mr. Ward. Present. Ms. Whalen. I'm here, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you very much. All right. We will now begin our meeting and Hopefully we do have some heavy hitters with us tonight. And so we're going to move forward. Again, please use the raise your hand. And I can see it much more quickly um, than sometimes where I can see you actually physically raise your hand. Okay, all right, so let us start. We're going to start with aging. Ms. Rotano. Yes, Madam okay. Chair, thank you. All right, all right. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. Uh, uh, you may begin. Please provide us with a summary 
of your budget and how it meets your department needs for 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to be here tonight to present our budget. Age-friendly Albany County Department for Aging has had an exciting year this year. More exciting than we could have ever envisioned, of course. Nevertheless, despite the pandemic, this department has landed on its feet. With help of federal stimulus money and the relaxation of rules by New York State Office for Aging, we were able to meet the sudden increase in home delivered meals due to the closing um, of congregate sites. We were also able to enter the grab and go model and our restaurant grant permitted takeout for those seniors participating in that unique program. We are happy to report that no funds have been held by New York State. In fact, NYSOPA has made it easier for us to stretch our dollars by removing restrictions on how the money is distributed. Currently, we have no seniors waiting for service. All needs are being met. COVID-19 challenged us to reimagine ways to care for our seniors and reassess our needs. Although our programs are manda mandated by the Older Americans Act, which was approved again by the federal government last year and will be in place for another seven years, we have been in close contact with all providers so that our levels of service can remain stable with the quality of care we are known to provide. We were able to accomplish our goal of starting a kosher halal home delivered express meal, um, home delivered express, and through some fast and excellent teamwork, we can now boast that we are meeting the needs of those two minority co uh, communities. Due to the temporary closure of congregate meal sites, we learned that it was possible to reduce our dietitian role to a part-time position. This change is a cost savings of more than $60,000 to the county. We have partnered with Cornell Cooperative Extension to handle the requisite nutritional requirements. We are seeing a slow and methodical reopening of 19 congregate sites. Our seniors are returning, but with a measured response. We were also able to somewhat reduce our ISEP line because we were overmatched and again could reduce local share. We continue to be able to meet the needs of those older adults. Our, our usual outreach in the community came to a sudden halt due to the non-congregating of more than 30 people. However, our drive-by Stop the Flu campaign has been a monumental success. We have done pop-up giveaways in almost every area of the county. And as you have heard me say many times, I believe a budget is a moral document. We are proud of what we have put before you and I believe this budget is exactly that. Thank you, thank you so much um, um, for your um, summary. Uh, now I'm, I'm going to start um, with a couple of questions here and then I'll open it up to our members. For those of you who are following along in your budget book, aging begins on page 71. And so uh, right now I'm going to uh, um, page- Can't seven. hear you. Pardon me? I didn't hear half of what you just said. I don't know if anyone else did. Okay, so if you have freezing. your budget books, if you have your budget books, Aging begins on page 71. Can everyone hear me now? Is that a yes? yes. Thank you. Yes. yes. Okay. Right. Now. So the first question begins on page 74. Fees for services is up $200,000. Can you explain why? Yeah. Um, fees for services uh, is up due to the stimulus money. Uh, Alex, Alec um, Hewless is with me, who's our finance uh, director. Um, yes, and so, I think that that would be the answer to that question. Yes, yeah, so basically because uh, New York State uh, Department for Aging uh, gave us money and uh, stimulus money uh, to cover uh, our COVID-19 expenses, uh, we will be able to uh, carry over 200, around $250,000 for 2021. Thank you. And also, um, 
congregate meals grant revenues are down $190,000. And that's found on page 75. Well, and again, uh, basically, this is due to the fact that in uh, current year, in 2020, we received uh, stimulus money. Uh, uh, stimulus money was given to us uh, by New York State Department for Aging. But uh, in 2021, we, did, we do not anticipate uh, another stimulus uh, money from NYSOFA, basically. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let's see. In light of COVID, are there any plans to extend or expand the congregate meals and home delivery program? Well, we're, uh, I'm not sure about a congregate site being able to open up another congregate site. That's probably still iffy. Um, we're waiting to see what, you know, what's coming down the pike. We can't, we can't predict it, um, but we're prepared to go back to um, grab and go meals or if we have to increase uh, the home delivered meals again, we're able to do that. Um, we do have funding, the stimulus money actually uh, that we received is good until September of 2021. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and, and, and this, has the social transportation program been, been eliminated permanently or just until it's safe to, tra to travel due to the COVID? Well, I think probably just until it's, it's safe to travel again. I mean, our whole um, congregate, um, well, we haven't got anybody really going on buses unless they're going to a doctor or something of that. All, there are no uh, senior trips. Senior centers aren't doing senior trips. We don't, we don't have any of that. So, um, you know, it's very difficult and it's an effort to try to keep the seniors safe um, because, you know, many of them wanna go out and they wanna be able to do things. And, uh, you know, we're taking it day by, we're taking it day by day. Thank you very much. Now, um, the over, overall revenues from the adjusted 2020 budget is decreasing from year to year. This is found on page 75. Can you comment on some of the increasing grants budgeted for 2021, such as supportive services, home delivered meals, nutrition service, and the nutrition service grant? Uh, yes, I uh -huh. Yeah, um, I'm confused. Are not those saying negative numbers? Yeah, so no, it's basically uh, you're asking the wise revenues are slightly higher, right? Um, yes. Yes, it's basically because in, in uh, when we uh, these are federal funds, and in um, what happens basically, we are allowed when we do not use all federal money for, in the current year in 2020, Understood. we can carry over those funds and use them, utilize them in next year in 2021. And um, my last question is, please comment on the change in dietary service being provided by Cornell Cooperative Extension, providing services and one registered dietitian and agent being eliminated from the budget. Well, um, as you know, a dietitian is um, required by the Older Americans Act. What we learned during COVID was that actually we were able to, um, and due to you know the closing of, of some of the sites, we were able to reduce the amount of hours that the dietitian would do. So it became a natural to for us to be able to um, collaborate with Cornell Cooperative. Uh, as it was, the dietitian had um, resigned, so it gave us the opportunity to kind of restructure that, and in the end. It's saving the county sixty thousand dollars, so we're we're real pleased about that. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And right now, I'm going to start with the chair of Elder Care, uh, Carolyn McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, um, Commissioner, for being here. Thank you for all the work that you do on behalf of our seniors. Um, we know it's been a very challenging year, and um, appreciate you and your staff and how you try to 
um, of manner. I lost Carolyn. Carolyn. Uh -huh. I, lost I think it's Carolyn. her internet. Uh, whatever yeah. else. I think she might be. I, th I, th I think she's frozen. <laughs> Carolyn? If you can yeah, you're hear. frozen for me. We're frozen to you. The video is going to go first and then the audio. If she restarted her modem, it'll it'll come Car back up. Carolyn? Okay, she's, she's starting over again. All right, so until Carolyn comes back in, I'm going to... Um, uh, Miss Miss McLean Lane, can you can you begin, please? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I just have something very brief to say, and I thank you for uh, allowing me time. I think the presentation given by this department was possibly one of the best presentations um, I have seen. Uh, and, and it was so well informed and I just wanted to say thank you. And Madam Chair, this wasn't a budget question and I apologize for that. I just wanted to recognize how succinct and great that presentation was. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Carolyn, are you back? Having, I don't know where the challenge is. I'll try and get it. All. Down then we do have some technological challenges down in this area. It's the same that she's talking. But so can anybody, can you hear me? It's all I'm asking. We can, can hear you now. No? Okay. Now I'll just go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, of your coming at sites had opened. Can Carolyn, are you on your phone and on your computer at the same no, time? No, I'm not. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm not on my iPad. Okay, Carolyn, um, uh, can you just hold on a moment while we um, try to fix this, okay? And, and yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so mm -hmm. uh, Mr. O'Brien. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was wondering how the, um, the uh, federal grant to allow seniors to dine out at you know, restaurants, how'd that go as far as uh, participation? And uh, it was a one of the few grants that we received, uh, that I shouldn't say we received, but was uh, uh, given to a, another region, Erie County as well, and Albany County was, was, was given a, a grant similar to that. How did that perform? Uh, I just was curious. It, well, I want to, I mean, I want to tell everybody it was, it was really a win-win for, for all of you, for all of us, it was a win-win. Um, we are sad to say, of course, that that grant is coming to the end, uh, at the end of December, and we're trying to work out with some of the other counties how we might re-envision that um, to see how we can make that work again, because we see that, it, it, that of course, it was created um, to eliminate social isolation for seniors, but it also showed a different way of doing business, of what another way to have a congregate meal in a different setting that seniors would really like because as boomers are coming up and yes, I'm one of them, um, you know, that's really the kind of what we're looking at. And I think that um, there was a call with NYSOFA last week. I can't begin to tell you how many counties were on that call asking us about what we did. We were very fortunate in that what the difference was between us and Erie County. And of course they were the lead agent on the grant we had restaurants, we didn't have a food court. They had a food court. We had real mom and pop restaurants um, from around, around the county. 
And the thing that was great about it was that when, when everything closed down and you could only do takeout, that helped so many small businesses to get them through that small period. And so who would have seen that a year ago? None of us. But in fact, it turned out to be that it benefited so many of these small restaurants and they're really interested in working in a, out a way that we would be able to continue um, with this project, you know, design some other way and um, disguise differently, but still being a go and dine program. Thank you for asking that question. Okay, great. I'm, I'm glad it worked out. Hope, you know, when things turn around, it, uh, you know, maybe we can, you know, get another grant or work with, with the county to get some additional money for Terrific. We'll see how it plays. I'm glad it. I'm glad it worked out. And uh, do you have a list of uh, of restaurants that part participated? Were they? I do. We had um, we had twelve restaurants. Uh, one went out of business during the pandemic. So mm -hmm. you know we have eleven left, and um, we are trying to put together um, you know a new version of it. You know, go and dine point or two point was it for lunch or was it for like an early dinner? Uh, um, some of the restaurants did dinner. Some did just lunch. Um, okay. Some did breakfast. Oh, okay. So, it, you know, it was um, it was great. There were different price points, of course. Sure. But, um, it, it was a hit. I mean, it was a hit for all of you and, and all of us here. And we loved it. It was a lot of work, um, but it was, it was just terrific. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can't hear Wanda if she's talking. Miss McLaughlin? Oh, okay. All right. So I'll, I'll move on until Carolyn um, um, gets herself uh, straight there. So, let's see. Uh, uh, Joe. Uh, all right. Um, Mr. Bergdorf. Mr. Bergdorf? Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I followed your instructions and muted myself, and now I just unmuted myself. Um, I, I submitted questions earlier today, and I got to tell you that I am uh, gratified to hear that no funds have been withheld from 2020 by New York State for the seniors. Um, and I uh, had also asked, with fee-for-service appropriations down almost 500000 from 2020 adjusted, and what programs are the reductions occurring? And I think I heard uh, Commissioner uh, say, or or your 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 budget associate, that there was two hundred thousand dollars left over in that line. Is that accurate? Uh, well, basically, uh, basically what happened? Why why it is less? Because uh, uh, we got the portion of a stimulus money from uh, New York State Department for Aging, right? And uh, in 2021, it's going to be less because we are not getting that money, but we are trying to carry over basically $250,000 from 2020 to 2021. So, but uh, the, the point is, is that uh, in, in 2020, uh, you budgeted uh, uh, $500,000 more than in 2021. Does that mean you will be returning money back to the general fund uh, no, for next no. year? No, no, we are not going to be returning the money uh, to general fund, no. Uh, we basically, we get, <laughs> because we still, uh, we still have um, a basically part of October, November, October, November in December, basically. So we're going to be using, we're going to be using portion of that money during this time frame, the last quarter, and then unused money will be, will be carried over to 2021. And we are talking, uh, we are talking about the stimulus money over here. Okay. Now that's federal stimulus money that flowed to the state. Okay. So that was from the federal government. And that was, uh, that was, Yes, that was from federal government given to uh, New York State Department. Okay, well, that's federal government money. Yes. Uh, now, uh, the three hundred thousand dollar reduction to ISIP, uh, you said you were overmatched. What did what does that mean? 
well, that makes it local. Uh, well, basically, uh, we, yeah, it it meant that we had uh, we have uh, we had extra money in case of emergency or a spike in expenses, and uh, because uh, preparing the 2021 budget, uh, we were told right that we need to reduce the county share, which we did, uh, and by reducing uh, ice supply by three hundred thousand dollars, we did that basically. So, so does, it, does, does that does that money roll forward back into uh, a 2020 surplus to be used for 2021, or what? What agreement do you have with uh, management and budget for well, uh, for that three hundred thousand dollars? I see. Well, it's basically uh, uh, as what concerns 2021, right? This unused money is going to be rolled in, in the general fund, basically. Yes. Into the general fund. Yes. Okay. So that, that's part of uh, cost cutting for 2020, which helps make up the deficit, which will roll into 2021. And uh, Commissioner, I'm very glad to hear that there were... Uh, no seniors waiting for uh, uh, any services and that you've, uh, uh, you've been able to manage through this disaster of the year 2020 and, uh, and met the needs of seniors in Albany County. And I thank you very much for that. Thank you. Is there anything the legislature can do to help you in the balance of 20 and 21? Give me till tomorrow, I'll think of something. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank All you, right. Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Bergdorf. And thank you for sending your questions in early. And remember, we will make sure that the, uh, the uh, agency heads get a chance to respond in their presentations. Okay? Thank well, that was, I, I've got to tell you, you hit, you hit three out of five of my questions in the presentation. So I do appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, Carolyn, are you in now? I don't know. Can you yes, you are. Yay. You're in. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know whether I'm on the iPad or on the phone, but either way, I, um, I again, I, I just wanted to thank the commissioner for all the hard work that she's put in and her staff to make sure that our most vulnerable citizens are being served and they don't feel like they've been left out in the midst of the pandemic. I um, was happy to look at, um, read the answers to the questions that were put in beforehand. And I just, as, when I got cut off, I was asking the question about how uh, spread out are the 19 sites, the congregate sites that were reopened? Um, can you just give me some idea of where they are? Yeah, there, um, not all of them are reopened yet for a lot of different reasons. Um, mostly because um, some of them are in public buildings and they've not reopened their common area so that there can't be a, you know, a dinner or a lunch there. So we're waiting for um, movement on that issue. Um, we did have, uh, I can tell you who's open, and that would be um, Cohoes and Livingston, um, Water Valley, Burn is open. Uh, Green Island is open, Ravina is open, Seville apartments are open, and we're waiting on um, we're waiting on the rest of them to uh, get permission to be able to uh, open their sites. That's right. So there's no site in Albany that's open the, uh, at this point in time. Yeah, in the city now. Oh, Livingston is. I'm sorry. Living, oh, Livingston. Livingston is open. Yeah. Okay. But um, the, the others are not yet in the city um, because, you know, the, I think a lot of them are, are um, public buildings and they're waiting for permission to be able to open up their uh, uh, dining areas. Okay. The, um, thank you. The, the new initiative that you have for 2021, the Go Go Grandparents Program. Yeah. Um, how are you going to... Um, do outreach for that program? Well, we're still, you know, we're still planning that. So um, I'm not exactly sure yet. We're doing that in collaboration with DSS um, with the ADRC money. 
Uh, so we're, uh, we're, we're, we're taking that a day at a time. Um, we're working with the other counties on it because that initiative really just came up um, through the triple A's. Okay. So um, I need to collaborate with the other, um, with the other counties to see exactly how they're doing it. And, um, but we plan on being able to give um, um, some seniors being able to issue them laptops so that they can communicate and have virtual um, uh, conversations with grandchildren and, um, uh, you know, family members to kind of reduce the isolation. Well, because this is similar to something that I had mentioned at a committee meeting a few weeks ago, where I wanted to have someone go in and really help connect seniors with technology and get trying to go out and get donations for um, iPads or whatever, low, some low tech kind of instrument so that and have someone go in and teach seniors how to use them so they can communicate, be it for their church services or um, interact with family um, visually. Um, so I'm very interested in this program. Yeah, so. um, the um, Jewish Family Services has already uh, got a grant uh, and they were able, um, through the help of um, Rabbi Moshe Bonzer, to be able to already start something very similar. So yes, I spoke uh, to Rabbi Spring, and he told me about that um, Beth Emmett has been doing some of that as well. Yeah, I mean, everybody's trying to do virtual, and, um, you know, we've got to be able to, to get the seniors hooked up. Um, so that's, you know, so we're trying to go for it, too. Okay. Thank you. The, um, the overtime um, that you showed, I think you showed a decrease in overtime. Uh, that you, no, that you did, you put money in for overtime, but you don't actually use it. Right. Is that correct? That's correct. So, so then what do you use that money for? Well, uh, basically, because we don't use it, it uh, at the end of the year, the money goes back to general fund. Okay, so you're not allowed to transfer it to another to another line. Well, it, you need? Uh, it, I well, it's in uh, the amount is insignificant basically, so it's only fifteen hundred. So, um, yeah, it's it's a question more a question to um, management and budget basically here. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I know when some of the other committee members and some of the other legislators asked some questions about the um, restaurant program and other pro questions that really sort of met some of the questions that I had. So I thank everyone for being so attentive. And my last question is, do you have any interaction with the committees um, at the state level that are talking about reopening um, or providing greater access to families to um, their loved ones that are in nursing homes? Are you a part of any of those discussions at any level? Only, only with statewide senior action council. And are they offering any any kind of hope at this point as to where we're going next? And well, if there are, is there any budgetary impact um, on that? You know, you know, I I don't really know the answer to that question, Carolyn. I can get back to you. Um, I know that uh, the Statewide Senior Action Council is uh, working on that because it's a big issue for them. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a concern of ours. Um, you know, we get calls here and there about, you know, people wanting to be able to see their loved ones and we, and we get that. And we also understand the idea of, of people being safe. So, um, but I can get back to you um, and I'll speak with Statewide tomorrow. Thank you very that's, much. That's, okay. the only, that's the only person that, um, um, that I've been in contact with. Okay. I can uh, jump in a little bit on, on some of it. Pretty much, this is Michael McLaughlin. Okay. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Madam Chair. So uh, in terms of pretty much any of the reopening um, items, um, we've been, and, and obviously nursing home visitation uh, and policy has been a big part of that, um, most of it is all being run through ESD and by extension through these control rooms. So, you know, uh, nursing home uh, uh, reopening has been part of the conversation, as well as any of the litany of issues that have come up 
through the reopenings. And while all of the advocacy groups, as the one that uh, Commissioner Rotano mentioned, um, are involved in the effort to urge the state to kind of do a certain thing. Um, all okay. the decisions seem to be made. Um, and then they go down through Empire State Development, which is generally the one that's propagating the rules to everybody. Some of them come through state DOH. And obviously the nursing home ones are heavily um, in, that fa in that kind of vein. But all questions related to, is this activity allowed? My, my activity falls within a gray area. They all seem to be shunted through ESD. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I know you want to move on, Wanda, so I'll just relinquish my time. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Um, Matt Peter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mine is a very brief question. How are you doing, Commissioner? Good. Thank you. I'm sorry to circle back. I actually just had a follow up to Mr. O'Brien's um, questions about the um, restaurant takeout ones. Um, how are those delivered? Like when, when they order them, I'm just, uh, you know, is it through a delivery service app or is it delivered by your agency? No, not delivered by my agency. Actually, um, uh, the restaurants themselves have either had a delivery service um, or the senior has driven up and they have curbside, uh, they have curbside pickup. Got it. Okay. That's all I got. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Mr. Grimm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, hello to everybody in aging, and thanks for your efforts. Uh, a couple of questions on, from page 74 in the budget, printing and advertising has gone up pretty substantially from uh, 10 uh, and change to about 15,000. I wonder what the reason was for that. Go and dine. What's that? The go and dine program. Oh, and you had that, you didn't have that previously? Well, it, you know, it came from the grant, so we had to increase it. We're also going to be starting a newsletter. That but we isn't that, but this is, the increase is for 2021, and I, I thought you were running out of the grant on that. We are running out of the grant money on that. Sorry. Um, so why did you increase advertising when the because grant? Because we're going to be, well, because we have other programs that we're going to want to advertise, and we're starting a newsletter. And we want to be, we plan to continue go, go and dine program, please. And we hope that we're going to be able to, you know, recreate a go and dine program in another fashion. Another question I have is a little hard to discern from the budget. Uh, obviously, there were services you weren't able to do because so many things were shut down. And but you've given a lot of grant money also. How much county money was saved from uh, the inability to uh, provide services that you might have otherwise? How, how, can you give me a ballpark of how much money was saved? county share of money and then what happened to that money well that's a great question but i can't answer it i you know i'd have to give you uh, an answer on that tomorrow because i i i don't know no that's okay i figured this might require a little bit of research but I'm just i mean thinking. you know like are you talking like relative to adult daycare where where that couldn't go forward yeah, I'm trying to get a handle, Deb, on, on, on how much we save county, and this is county share now, because I know you have a lot of grants in there. Yes. But I'm trying to get a handle on what the difference was in terms of savings, and then what, do we, what did we do with the money? Well, basically, yes, basically, yes, yeah, the county share uh, for most of our federal programs is uh, only like 10%, right? 10% county match, which is not really significant. And most of the money is that because uh, during MDD, NYSOFA allowed us to use that funding sources to pay for uh, basically other um, other needs, like most of the money that we uh, were unable to use for adult services, we used to pay for meals, for congregate meals, home delivered meals. So technically we used that money and we used that county share. Whatever county share was not used will be will go again back to general general fund at the end of the year but we because uh, because of the mdd and because nysova removed removed all the limitations on how we can use the money we we were able to use all that money basically all right so you're saying there wasn't a lot of county share money saved then is that what i'm hearing well what i'm uh, what i'm basically saying uh uh, there was a portion definitely of the uh, county money that were not used, but uh, but more but what 
most of it basically what what we planned for what, uh, we used basically i cannot okay. yeah we cannot we cannot give you the exact numbers as that right. said, but yeah, yeah. well let you just don't know how much you go it's just we, if you can give me a list of we can get that we're going to save and then we're, we're just just another day just like they yeah. said you know i'm yeah, back you follow up and get that back to us thank you thank mm -hmm. you Madam Chair. thank you um miss retano i yes. just i just want to thank you so very much um for your presentation and the information that you've given us tonight. Um, we want to also extend our um, uh, gratitude for all of the hard work that every agency has done over this past six months in regards to the pandemic. So right now I'm going to bid you good evening and um, stay safe. Madam Chair. And all of you, thank you thank so you. much. Mr. Clay. I have my, uh, this. Uh, I, Did I miss I, you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I'm used to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just have a quick question for the commissioner. Can, can you tell me whether or not, and uh, uh, if the agency is providing uh, dinners or uh, uh, to uh, the housing development up on Second Street, the senior housing up there? Is there any dinners being provided up there? Do you Are know? you talking about Idlewild? Well, I actually, Idlewild is the one that was burned out. But yeah, was it was. Drake. I'm talking Drake. Uh, we do not have we do not have a, a meal at Drake. No. Is there a reason? Uh, no, I don't think any. I, I I mean I don't know since I've been here nobody has uh, asked of that. Um. Uh, do you, uh, you know, we'd be happy to entertain that though. All right, Commissioner, thank you. I'll check. Okay, thank you so much. You've been very popular tonight. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you all very much for entertaining me tonight. Stay well and stay safe. All right. Thank you, Good Commissioner. Thank you. Hi, Deb. Now we're going to move forward. And again, um, I'm just going to ask the members to to um, understand this. We can uh, that we want to um, be able to for you to ask your questions, but at the same time, when I see that I have seven and eight members wanting to speak, uh, we do have a we don't want to have too long of a night in front of us. And you can always submit your questions, like Mr. Bergdorf, who's been very good about that. <laughs> And, and so just keep that in mind. We're going to move on now to mental health, Dr. Giordano. And I just want to remind um, everyone of my, um, uh, of my opening statement in regards to the fact that the legislators have been provided with your written responses to our budget information request letter. And we thank you for your cooperation in providing them. However, in order to complete a more thorough examination of your budget, it may be necessary to forward to some additional questions after tonight's hearing. So would you please um, begin your summary, Mr. Giordano? Good evening, Madam Chair. It's very nice to see you. Maybe someday we'll be able to see each other in person again. Yes, yes, that would be nice. <clears throat> uh, yes, I would like to give a brief uh, opening summary and address some of the questions as well that were sent uh, ahead of time. I think in general, I'm hoping that I leave you tonight with um, a, a, a double-sided message, one of hope, because I think there is great hope uh, to be had, and uh, one of concern, because there is so much going on in our world right now that uh, touches on at least the mental health department. But it is a hard act to follow of, after Commissioner Rotano. That was pretty good. Uh, I'll do my best. Uh, first, uh, and, and most importantly, I, I'd like the opportunity to just call attention and to thank the women and men of the mental health department. We have been fully operational throughout this year, from day one of the shutdown and the, uh, 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 the exacerbation of the pandemic. And, um, you know, we're not often thought of as first responders. Uh, but I will tell you that in a number of our services, we have been on the front lines from day one through today. And uh, I am very proud 
to be associated with those folks who had to come in and serve the needs of others while they were also uh, so concerned about themselves and their families. So uh, I, I wanted to start with that. Uh, it is important to underscore the fact that uh, we have, you know, we've been challenged in ways we never anticipated before, but we didn't really skip a beat. Our crisis services uh, have been operational. Our jail services have been operational. Our clinic services have been very busy, as well as our community and forensic services. We've had to modify and to adjust, though, quite a bit. And uh, I can talk to you later about those modifications, but suffice it to say, we have taken advantage of the uh, telemental health uh, opportunities that we didn't even know were there for us, uh, which has dramatically changed the way we serve our, our community. And um, I think we'll endure past the pandemic because we're now able to reach folks for whom coming into the office was a challenge in the past. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, our no-show rates have gone down. Our attendance has gotten greater. Uh, all but all because we've opened up another opportunity for folks to receive services. And another modification we did very early on was uh, at the behest of the county executive, we started a, a county mental health support line. And um, we have been operational with that since then. The calls have been reduced a little bit. And I think that reflects the fact that our community is uh, dealing with things a little better, but we have been uh, able to uh, modify our crisis services to provide a hotline. To remind you and to uh, some of the new members, you know, the, the mental health department has a unique position in the community. We provide safety net services to acutely and chronically mentally ill people. Uh, we treat people uh, that, and serve people rather, who uh, other agencies can say no to, we very rarely will say no. Uh, and, and I think the message of hope that I was referring to earlier is that we've kept by and large our promise to the people that depend on us uh, from the beginning of the year to today. Uh, but importantly, you know, we're a critical piece of a mosaic. Uh, that mosaic needs to be recognized too. And if you, in, in our budget, you see that there is $16 million of state pass-through money that comes to us uh, directly to 24 OASIS and OMH mental health and addiction programs. That comes to like 80, 82 separate programs that we set the tone for, we oversee and monitor. And, um, uh, you know, we're a critical service, the, the mental health department, but we can't do it all. We don't do it all. And, and we um, are part of that mosaic. Uh, so what have we learned this year? Uh, two things that stand out to me. W one is, is that, uh, boy, we're, we're, we're vulnerable in ways that we never th could have thought. Uh, and, and, uh, but importantly, my goodness, we're resilient in ways that we never would have imagined. And I think the mess, the, the moral of the story is that you never really know what you're capable of until you're tested. But, um, you know, our community, uh, uh, has, has reacted in ways that could be somewhat predictable. Uh, initially, folks were a little reluctant, as, as I think Dr. Whalen will, will attest to later in, in the healthcare domain, people were not going to the doctors, people were not going to the hospital uh, out of fear. Um, and we saw similar kinds of things in the beginning. Our emergency rooms, our psychiatric units were not as um, highly populated as usual. But that, that is changing though. Um, our services, though, have always been busy throughout. Um, I, I think, though, that we're not yet seeing the long-term effects. And, and I, would, I would say that there are going to be post-traumatic mental health effects in our community uh, as a result of all the things that you all know too well about. The, the, the personal losses, the losses of unemployment, the um, exacerbation of pre-existing mental illness and addiction, uh, the causing of, of disorders that didn't exist before, uh, really a perfect storm of sorts. And so uh, while I'm proud to say we have met the challenge to date, we've kept our feet above water, our heads above water, we've kept our promises to our patients that depend on us, 
uh, the future is going to be a challenge. And um, so our budget, uh, as, as you know, is um, it's a $27.8 million budget. As I mentioned, $16 million is, is uh, 100% state pass through to us. And uh, that gives us, as I said before, the ability to set the tone of services and to oversee and monitor the quality and the comprehensiveness of services of which our um, department is, is, is part of the continuum. Um, there was some a, a rise in county share, as you'll see. And um, I can talk more about this later. I'm sure you have a question about it. But the governor, uh, I like the guy, but I don't want to blame people. But the governor decided at the last minute to put a burden on counties. All 57 counties got the same burden. But it was the doubling of the cost of um, treating in psychiatric hospitals individuals who are deemed not competent to proceed in a criminal trial. And um, the amount that we are projecting the county share will go up is, is the uh, amount that likely will be uh, attributed to that uh, unfunded mandate uh, that happened on April 1st. Um, <clears throat> But there were a couple of questions that were sent ahead of time. And before I, I, I stop, if I could just um, try to address some of those. They had to do with grants. Um, is that all right, Madam Chair? Can I address yeah. the grant? Yeah? Yes. OK. Um, so we have two uh, major grants right now that we have um, that I want to report to you about. One we have concern about, and one uh, we are, are less concerned, but we have yet to get a final uh, verdict on. This is all money from the state. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention to you is it's a $130,000 grant uh, for reentry services for returning citizens from our state prisons, many of them who have a, a host of human service needs, including mental health. Uh, you know, th this is a tough thing. We're so proud of this program. We have come to you on many occasions to talk to you about it. Uh, the grant expired on uh, September 30th of 2020. And for the month of September and for the last week or two of October, we are getting emails. And just this morning, another from the, the uh, DCJS, it's the Division of Criminal Justice Services, from their commissioner level, folks, uh, hold on. The money's coming. We have uncertainty. Where, uh, you know, we are continuing to provide this service, but um, with just like with many state level uncertainties, this is one of them. So, uh, this is something we'll we'll keep you posted on. I think it's a day to day event. We are being promised the money, but we haven't seen it. Uh, and um, the other grant is, is a $223,000 grant that goes to the end of the year. And this one is through the Medicaid redesign project uh, that went to Better Health of Northeastern New York, an affiliate of Albany Medical Center Hospital. And uh, as some of you who heard me in previous years talk about this grant, we're in our third year of this. It allowed us to move our mobile crisis services to a 24-7 uh, operation. And with great, with great positive result in the community, uh, especially important these days. Uh, and uh, we're told that, the, uh, the, that we should be very optimistic about that being refunded, but we have not heard about it yet. Those are the two grants that uh, we have our eyes on. Uh, you know, of course, you've asked me this in past years, and, I, and I'll say it again. Everyone we hire under a grant knows that... Um, you know, if the, the, their position is contingent on the grant, we would hate to end the service of anyone, especially since it's so valuable. But, um, you know, we're taking it day by day on both of those grants. Uh, I think those were the, the pre, the questions that were sent ahead of time. So I, I, I will be glad to answer anything else you have for me, uh, Madam Chair. And thank you, Dr. Giagiano. Uh, uh, Mr. Peter. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, uh, hello, Dr. Giordano, and uh, thanks for coming in to talk to us. Yes, sir. Um, this is going to be along the same veins of what I've, uh, I asked last year in the budget and within the confines that 
you know, when you don't spend money uh, on mental health on the early prevention side, mm -hmm. you pay for it a different way. Mm -hmm. And I've often seen people cut mental health budgets and things of that nature, mm -hmm. only to see it, negative effects in the community and uh, bad effects with law enforcement being called in mm -hmm. when it's too late. So my, my questions are going to be sort of around this preventative type aspects of it. The, the first one is, um, and I've heard this from um, Albany law enforcement. I've heard this from county law enforcement. Um, where have we found there to be gaps in places where, where there's mental health needs, whether it's beds or overnight facilities? You know, often I'll hear from APD or others. They, they try to get someone who is in need um, at an overnight uh, observation, things like that. They weren't, they, there, was no, there were no beds. Mm -hmm. So they dropped them off at the ER who released them two hours later back on the streets. There were three more calls. They were getting worse and worse, things of that nature. Yeah. Uh, I remember quite well your questions along those lines from last year. Uh, well, I'll be glad to, to, to address them. They're multifaceted and they, they extend across many domains. So I will try to, I will try to accept responsibility for where I can. And uh, again, I don't like to blame, but the, I have to point arrows in other directions as well, because there's influences that um, are coming from many sources. So, and, and Dr. Giordano, if, if this is a long, like multifaceted okay. thing, we can wait and talk about this outside of this question and answer, because I don't want to cause this to be over long. And if we, if we can talk about this in a week or so, sure. that's perfectly fine. Well, yeah, um, I don't mean to, I didn't mean to um, dodge the question. I can give you no, a short, I, I give you a short version, and then we can go offline as you wish. Sure. Um, so there's a long history in this country of deinstitutionalization, uh, and it has uh, permeated our mental health care system for decades. And the problem is, is that the the money that was supposedly saved by closing hospitals has never made it fully to our communities. That has resulted in uh, uh, an overburden on community services without adequate federal and state funding. We have always done uh, what we could with our local partners and we, we work arm in arm with law enforcement. Um, but I will tell you that uh, we have had situations where uh, I've heard, I get calls as well, sometimes in the middle of the night uh, and sometimes from law enforcement. I've had calls that uh, Albany Medical Center and CDPC and Samaritan Hospital and Ellis Hospital and Saratoga Hospital are all not taking patients because their emergency rooms are filled with psychiatric cases. Their inpatient beds are filled and they don't know what to do. Uh, we have had situations still, and I remember talking to you about this last year, uh, episodic but they still happen where um, we have to make do in the community with people who need to be in the hospital. Uh, so. And well, we can talk more about that offline because I think there's a large financial cost that goes into the county on that and the, the lack of it. And I think we need to, to document that and have a deeper conversation. And if it's okay, Madam Chairwoman, I just had one other quick question. We'll see. Um, and again, Dr. Giordano, if you don't have this right in front of you, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to wait for, for the answer. Um, what are the number of staffers in the mobile crisis unit? And then how many shifts um, are there within that? Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. Okay. Um, right now, we're, we're staffed 24-7. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. We have three shifts, and they're basically uh, 8 to 4, 4 to 12, 12 to uh, midnight to 8 with a swing shift in the uh, highest uh, need time frame that we've figured out over the years. It's like 11 to seven during the day. Uh, we have two people on each, uh, we have three people on each of the, the day shift and the evening shift, one person on the overnight shift and one person on the swing shift. So we now have, um, we have eight folks they're all licensed social workers. One of them is a team leader, uh, and that's our staffing with mobile crisis. Do you believe you have adequate staff to, to respond across the county, given how many different mm -hmm. um, towns and cities use those services? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, we, we are busy. 
we've very rarely though uh, turned down calls. Uh, if anything, we encourage local law enforcement to use us more. We still have uh, local law enforcement agencies that either don't know about us or won't or don't want to call us. Uh, you know, I'd be a fool if I said we we can't use uh, you know more more of everything, but um, I, I think we have, have mastered the 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 mobile crisis team uh, penetration throughout the counties. We work very closely with our law enforcement partners and um, our hospitals. Uh, interestingly, this year we have um, seen a a reduction early on in the pandemic of of calls. And, um, you know, a, a lot of the calls that we did handle were uh, from the police rather than from citizens. Uh, so do I think we have enough? We, we, we penetrate the community very well with the services we have. Uh, I think I said this to you last year, if you gave us a million dollars, I am sure we would be able to spend it. Um, but we're covering our bases. And, and right now, I don't think that puts our community at any risk. Thank you, Dr. Giordano. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a couple of questions for you, sure. uh, Dr. Giordano. Um, why is a Northeast doing business as the workshops contract line down more than a half to 372, one, uh, 169? Right. Uh, so That's on page 175. Yes. Um, so th th they are, um, Myrtle, that's a good question. Um, they are merging with uh, a program in Troy and um, their services are not being diminished. Um, uh, I have to get back to you with the details on that. They're merging with, um, that, that's fine. That's yeah. that's fine. If you can, yeah. if you need to answer another day, that is fine. Yeah, their services are not being diminished. Their their funding stream is going in a different direction, not coming through us. All right. Um, on page 170, can you explain the revenue adjustments in your narcotic addiction control account? Um, the 03486 uh, revenue line increasing by a million dollars and the 04486 is decreasing by almost the exact same amount? Uh, I'm sure there's an easy answer to that and um, I will have to get back to you. That's fine also. And um, my last question is the narcotics addiction control revenue on page 174. Mm -hmm. And the item number 03486 is decreasing by roughly $139,000 or 53%. Can you explain the reason for the decrease from year to year? Madam Chair, I'm going to ask permission to answer all of both of those questions together. I'll get you the answer to that as soon as I can. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see who's next. Um, Paul, M Mr. Bergdorf? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I, I, I really only have two questions left. Thank you. Um, doctor, uh, have you had any money withheld from the state at all so far this year? Uh, we have had um, uh, money withheld, yes. Uh, what sort of, uh, what's, um, what kind of volumetric basis? So uh, both OMH and OASIS have um, held back um, in their uh, quarterly uh, allotments to us. And um, I have those numbers for you here. Let me just see. <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have my fiscal person here with me. What we, we've, we've been told uh, for Q3 and for Q4, that um, there was going to be a, 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 a hold back uh, and we would be made whole in the subsequent quarter. So that happened in Q3. Uh, we weren't made whole in Q4. 
and we're told that we will be made whole at the end of the year. They're waiting on federal money, federal money, I guess. Okay, that's a, uh, that seems to be the, uh, um, this, this sort of standard answer. It's, it's not a cut, it's a withhold, hoping for the, for the best. Um, the other question I have for you is you alluded to it in your uh, opening statement, and I've listened to your presentations now for five years. Listen. And I, I've got to tell you, I really appreciate the challenge that you face and the resources that you have to get it done. But, you know, you talked about sort of the perfect storm. Yes. Uh, and it's coming. Uh, I would think from a mental health point of view, uh, when people's unemployment insurance ends or is reduced and violence continues and evictions start to happen and mortgage delinquency, de delinquencies increase and COVID malaise increases or there's a second uh, wave. Um, what ability do you have to re redeploy your internal resources to sort of, uh, to use the vernacular of the day, hit the hot spots and uh, do what you have to do to uh, triage uh, probably a, uh, a larger caseload? Well, we're, we're always uh, keeping our eye on that ball as best as best we can. Um, and, and again, we're part of a network of services in this community. So we, we do not carry that burden uh, entirely, but we're responsible for making sure the resources amongst our, our contract agencies and the direct services we provide are adequately allocated. Um, so, uh, you, know, you know, we can't take services away from people to give to others. We have to um, uh, make sure that, that whatever else is available in the community uh, addresses the need. So for, just as an example, um, our clinic uh, in this last nine months or so, we have uh, increased the services to the people that we already have in our clinic. Um, and we have worked with our community providers to absorb some of the increased need that might have arisen from uh, new arrivals. Uh, you know, we, we can't give up uh, on the people that we're working with to address the new folks. And the new folks have to be uh, treated by the, the, the continuum of services in our community. And again, I, I guess while well, I just referenced to you the, um, the uh, the part of the budget that is our, our OASIS and OMH contract agencies. We work with them on a very close basis, almost day to day on, on case assessment, case referral. Uh, and and um, very, I, I can't think of a case that we, has come up that we haven't been able to attend to in one form or another. But just because someone comes to the mental health clinic on Thursday doesn't mean they're gonna be treated at the mental health clinic on Thursday. We might have to partner, use one of our community partners, uh, that other $16 million in our budget uh, to make sure they get some services elsewhere. So we're triaging patients every day, all day. Uh, so all I can tell you is that so far we're, we're swimming very hard and our heads above water and the, need are, the needs are being met. Uh, it's hard to predict what this is going to look like moving forward. I think there is going to be uh, a, a, um, a post-traumatic stress part of this that we're going to see moving forward. But right now we're covering all our bases uh, as best I can tell. Well, thank you very much, doctor, for what you do. And thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bergdorf. Mr. Grimm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Giordano, it's good to see you again. Yes, sir, thank you. I, I think mental health spending is some of the most important spending this county does. And we are so incredibly fortunate to have you as our leader in that regard. So thank you. Thank you, sir. I, so there's one question I have, and you, you really caught my attention when you said telehealth dramatically has changed the way we do business. Absolutely right. And I'm wondering, moving forward, will that have cost implications, telehealth, and impact on care as well? But uh, will that help us save money in any way? Well, I think it's going to depend on, on, on how you look at it, because my feeling is, is 
we are able to touch more lives and penetrate deeper into our community using telehealth. Uh, I, and we might discover even more need in the community. And it's hard to know if we're gonna save money that way. We still need the clinicians uh, and we may, need, we may even need more clinicians. I have an eye towards, as you and, and my bosses remind me all the time, uh, you being the, 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 the legislature, um, to be looking for avenues of saving uh, money. But um, uh, I think the, the, the telehealth is gonna allow us to serve more people. And I don't know if that's gonna come cheaper. Okay. Thank you, uh, doctor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, Mr. Giordano. Again, I, I just, I thank you for all of your um, service and your staff and all that you've done. But I, I just have a, a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Can, can you just tell me if you can, and just very briefly, what your housing coordinator is responsible for? That is a title in our budget that um, uh, is soon to be um, uh, changed. Um, but our housing coordinating function uh, oversees all of the residential uh, programming in our community and um, uh, we have over 800 or 900 mental health residential opportunities in our community and, and the housing coordinator function uh, is to make sure that the highest need folks are getting into those opportunities and those include supported apartments and community residents and, um, and the like. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say good evening to you. And I want to thank you for your presentation. And just to let you know, um, um, Albany County does appreciate the hard work that you and your staff put forward. So thank I'm you very much, Madam you. Chair. It's greatly appreciated. OK, good evening and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. you Absolutely. We are now going to move on to um, the health department. And Dr. Whalen, and I'm just going to repeat um, the last part of my, my little speech here. Legislators have been provided um, with your written responses to our budget information request letter, and we thank you for your cooperation in providing them. And we realize it may be necessary um, um, to forward you some additional questions after tonight's um, hearing. So we are ready for your presentation this time. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and uh, members of the legislature. I am also joined this evening by Assistant Commissioner for Finance, Shanna Witherspoon, um, who is in a separate office, but should also be on the, on the feed here. And I believe Mary Beth Miller, Assistant Commissioner of Health is also on the call. So um, as all of you know, uh, 2020 has been an unprecedented year here at the health department um, dealing with a global pandemic. This is something that we have worked in public health uh, to prepare for, um, but still the challenges have certainly been beyond the scope of anything this department has uh, done in the pa past. Um, we have risen to the challenge of response and have been operating um, seven days a week uh, since the beginning of March. We had our first case on the 12th of March um, and we have been um, working, uh, we get reports of every single laboratory confirmed case. We reach out to every single laboratory confirmed case and currently we're um, tracking above 3000 cases so, so thus far, uh, perform case investigations uh, and determine uh, contacts um, and make sure that individuals are appropriately isolated and quarantined. Um, we have protected high-risk populations, including provisions of personal needs, coordinated uh, placement of homeless individuals with our uh, DSS. Um, we've provided an extensive amount of public information, um, participating in nearly daily press conferences. Um, and providing a call center for members of the public um, to call and get information on COVID-19. 
Um, we've conducted surveillance and provided data analytics uh, and came up early in the course of the pandemic with a forward facing database that's available for members of the public to look at on our website, which in addition to giving uh, numbers of cases, uh, gives information on demographics and where uh, COVID is most um, uh, prominent in terms of zip code location. Um, we have worked extensively with partners to ensure that we have availability of testing originally with our hospital partners, um, and then uh, with the state health department um, uh, in standing up um, the SUNY site. Uh, we have also worked extensively with our federally qualified health center, Whitney Young, which um, is a great partnership to ensure that we had test equity in our high risk neighborhoods. Uh, they utilize their mobile van to do testing for COVID particularly in our South End and West Hill neighborhoods. Um, that was a, has been and continues to be a successful partnership. Um, we have uh, communicated and coordinated with our providers uh, the numerous, um, usually daily, uh, guidance from uh, the New York State Department of Health and advisories. Uh, we've coordinated uh, COVID-19 containment mitigation education activities with governments, healthcare systems, and schools. Uh, we continue very active work with schools in Albany, um, and that includes the K through 12 community um, meeting with their superintendents and um, the, uh, the universities in Albany and the College of St. Rose. And uh, I think the, the, we have had testing collaborations with uh, those entities um, that have been very successful. We've provided um, FIT testing, which is testing for N95 um, uh, masks to providers and community stakeholders. We have been able to give out some PPE uh, and coordinate that with uh, our early supplies. We have um, really uh, needed to adapt um, a lot of new uh, databases and technologies, both for uh, case investigation and contact tracing. So that involved a lot of training of our staff. Um, we uh, have addressed concerns from the public and businesses on compliance with state COVID-19 preventive guidances. Um, we continue to work with multiple community partners on a daily basis, um, answering hundreds of calls uh, per day, um, managing uh, large uh, uh, clusters of illness in the community um, and working with local businesses um, where there have been concerns along with members of the public. Uh, the work has been daunting. It has been challenging. Uh, it, has, um, there, it has involved a significant degree of overtime. Early on in the pandemic, um, we were here from seven in the morning until 10 p.m. Uh, that was seven days a week and we were also uh, getting calls uh, much later. And those hours, though we don't continue to uh, staff the health department, we are, we are working remotely on weekends. Um, we continue to work seven days a week um, very actively on response and are very closely monitoring our numbers and the situation uh, as we move forward. Um, in addition to this, we continue to keep up our work around our accreditation status and our work uh, around other uh, usual public health work. There was a time um, during the uh, onset of the um, increase in cases that we did close our dental clinic, uh, but we have reopened that. We are seeing patients for STDs and for TB. Uh, we continue to do uh, some of our community health work. Um, we continue uh, to work with our uh, community partners on our um, community health assessment and community health improvement plan. Uh, so, you know, while we have not been able to continue all of our work, uh, we do um, uh, continue to have a hand in the, uh, the regular uh, grant uh, work and uh, programs and services that are so important uh, to the community. Um, I will uh, share, uh, we did get some questions on the pandemic in terms of uh, the um, preparation that we have in place for a second wave. Um, you know, at this point, near, not nearly, 100% of our staff 
has been involved in some way, shape, or form in COVID response. We have had to train a large amount of people to do case investigations uh, because they are very time intensive and uh, can take hours uh, in the course of a day. And when you get um, you know, 40 cases a day, it is, uh, it, there are a lot of hours involved in doing uh, those case investigations. Um, we have um, trained individuals uh, in our Medical Reserve Corps early on, we utilized also staff from other county agencies for a period of time, um, but we are very challenged still to maintain the staffing necessary to respond. And um, to be completely frank with you, our staff is exhausted. Uh, we have a core group of individuals um, who you know, are working seven days a week. Um, and uh, it is a challenge sometimes for me to encourage people to take days off. Uh, I am uh, incredibly um, uh, lucky and um, impressed to have such a dedicated staff, um, to have people that you actually have to tell sometime to go home. Um, but it, the work, uh, we are all very conscientious in this work and want to make sure that we're continuing uh, to, to respond. Um, it is a very big challenge. Uh, we did have some initial um, funding from uh, state and federal partners uh, that enabled us to get uh, additional technology first and then um, did enable us to uh, start the process to be able to hire additional very badly needed staff. Um, but you know, it, it seems sometimes that um, you know, we would nearly need to double our staff for us to be able to work in uh, you know, a normal hours capacity. So it, 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 is, it is a big challenge. Um, we do um, have a, a line item for some overtime, and we did utilize quite a lot of overtime um, for, in our budget. Um, but you know, we, we continue to look for opportunities to uh, to supplement our staff and to utilize additional resources. Um, so uh, that is kind of in short where we are now. It is an extremely dynamic situation. It is an extremely dynamic response. Uh, it seems every day um, brings a new challenge. Um, one of our current very difficult challenges is uh, the mandate uh, for um, students in K through 12 who have been um, out of school for more than 48 hours without a, a negative COVID test to be declared a case and have a full case investigation. This is simply untenable to be able to do this. And we're, we're working with state partners um, and NYSECHO, the New York State Association of County Health Officials to try to figure out the best way uh, that we can do that. Our school partners have been fantastic. Um, we are in daily communication with them. Um, we have provided um, information to uh, the superintendents and to the nurses have open dialogue with them going forward. We are managing all laboratory positive cases uh, and we are really working to try to ensure that we can have um, increased access to rapid testing. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a very challenging uh, situation. And um, an additional challenge is the fact that um, the gold standard for testing is the PCR test, which takes a couple of days to come back. So a lot of the rapid testing, while they are, um, those means of testing are more convenient for people, uh, they can provide a positive um, in a situation um, where someone is positive for COVID with uh, relatively good reliability. But if individuals are symptomatic and they test negative via a rapid test, the uh, guidance is then to go follow it up with the PCR test, which can result in additional uh, delays. So it is, um, you know, it, it has been unprecedented in so many ways, shapes, or form and forms. Um, when we look at a, a, a respiratory pathogen that can be spread um, both pre-symptomatically and in asymptomatic individuals, uh, the challenges are really, um, you know, uh, the stuff of public health. Um, I won't say nightmares, but I will say it's probably the most challenging scenario in terms of a pandemic that we could have. Uh, we continue very close uh, work with our state and uh, federal partners, and um, uh, you know, this work this work evolves on a on a daily basis. Um, so, Shanna, do you want to discuss a little bit about the, the finances, and then um, perhaps we can we can open up uh, to uh, questions. 
Sure. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman and members of the legislature. I will address some of the um, questions that we got beforehand. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we got notification that we were getting 20% withholding on two of our grants, the TB grant and our disease intervention specialist grant. Um, so far, the total withhold from those two grants are um, was $12,294. So not a big lift. Um, since as of now, we've only received notification about those two grants um, and the 20% being withheld. And this was only for the grant year. For DIS, the grant year ends in um, December 31st, 2020. And for the TB, it ends um, 3-31-2021. Um, since we've only been notified of those two grants, we don't see any potential loss of positions um, because of it. Um, there was a question about the $6 million that we have in revenue and the breakdown of it. So our revenues are broken down really between local fees and community grants, um, state grants, and then federal grants. So the way how it breaks down is our local grants and community grants is a total of about $1.2 million. The state grants, which includes state aid, which is where we get 30, 36% um, reimbursement for our um, state aid um, acceptable programs, and that is $3.1 million. And the federal grants is a total of $1.7 million for a total of the 6 million that we have in revenue. Um, the other question was if there was a 20% withholding through 2021, what would the potential liability be to the county? And that would be about $620,000 since the 20% withholding would only go to the um, state grants and not the federal or the local funding that we would be receiving through local fees and our community partner grants. And um, that is all that I have and I would open it up for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Witherspoon. I am going to start with uh, by saying I, I appreciate um, your efforts very much. Uh, Mr. O'Brien. Joe? Okay. There you go, okay. Dr. Whalen, thank you so much for all you've done. I can't thank you uh, enough. Um, my district is uh, comprised of seniors and many of them told me that they looked forward to your updates and you were very reassuring uh, during those. Thank you. Service to the county. Thank you. Ms. McQueen Lane. Thank you, Madam Chair. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I guess I just need to uh, reiterate exactly what my colleague, um, Legislator O'Brien, just said. Um, Dr. Whalen, you have done a yeoman's job, and your entire staff has as well. Um, you know, I, I have two nine year olds in school. And, uh, you know, in at Blessed Sacrament over in uh, 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 on the Albany Colony line. And uh, the work that you do and the work that all of your staff has done, um, you have kept uh, transmissions low. You have done an unbelievable job. And I just want to reiterate the kind words that my colleague, Mr. O'Brien just said, and thank you very much, um, Madam Chair, for uh, uh, humoring me, I guess, uh, instead of uh, doing pointed questions on this budget. I think this budget is uh, uh, well spent in this time. So thank you, Dr. Whalen, and thank you, Chair Willingham. I really appreciate my time. Thank you, Ms. McLean Lane. 
I want to acknowledge that uh, Joanne Cunningham um, was present. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Bergdorf. Um, Madam Chairwoman, uh, by submitting many of my questions in advance, I'm uh, honestly pleased that probably 90% of them were, uh, were answered in uh, the commissioner and her uh, finance director's presentation. And I'm glad to see that the 20% uh, the that's been withheld so far is, is only $12,000. And if that were to continue through all of 2021, uh, it would be $620,000. Um, uh, I too need to compliment Dr. Whalen and the entire DOH staff. They've done a Herculean job in guiding Albany County residents through this uh, pandemic. And uh, it's hard to go through this budget and think about all the other things that the Department of Health does and is responsible for and their core mission because that kind of loses its uh, uh, importance when you're, when, you're, when you're facing the alligators in the moat. Um, uh, so I, once again, I'd, I'd like to give that uh, compliment to the uh, doctor and her staff. Um, uh, I must have missed the, uh, the overtime figure in the budget. Uh, I don't have a problem with overtime. I know you need to do whatever it is you have to do to, uh, uh, to contain this virus, contact tracing, quarantining, checking on people and do, do whatever it is. Um, I see that you have a number of vacancies and that uh, unfortunately, or fortunate for the people who took the buyout and retired, you have uh, uh, sort of a, a fairly substantial hole in your organization. Are you getting, uh, uh, Commissioner, are you getting adequate uh, support from the committee to fill vacancies, to plug those gaps, to kind of get yourself a little bit of a reprieve uh, for uh, the people who've been working 20 hours a day? Um, we are getting support. I will say that, you know, even in pre-COVID um, times, we were challenged at the health department uh, filling staff and, ret and retaining our staff. Um, this is largely due to the fact that we are uh, right next door to the state health department. Um, and in fact, before COVID, uh, we lost nearly our um, entire Department of Emergency Preparedness to the New York State Department of Health. Uh, and people left, um, you know, for some of them for nearly double their salaries. So it is a, it's, it's a huge challenge uh, to be able to maintain uh, a competent um, professional workforce um, with that uh, looming um, competitor. Uh, and many people that are in public health, you know, for them, it, it, the, the benefits are quite similar. And, uh, you know, the, the work uh, week is quite similar. So it's, it's very difficult to compete with that. Um, and we have had many people in the past three years uh, leave for the state health department for that reason. So uh, I do see that going forward being a problem. I think we've been really lucky that we the, the staff that are here throughout this, no one has left. Everyone has pretty much stayed put and put in a load of extra work and just dedicated an unbelievable um, sense of purpose to the entire mission of uh, protecting the county against COVID. Um, but you know, in a post COVID world or when we get past that, I worry that that will continue to be a problem for us. Uh, I have one last question, and it's uh, it's almost trivial in nature. Uh, I noticed on page 137 that um, DOH is requesting $380,000 less for fees for services from the 2020 adjusted. Um, can you describe which which services or or your finance director are are impacted, or what would cause a reduction? Because I find it hard to believe that given these times, there, there's any cost that you can reduce. 
So that is due to us reallocating funds. Um, we did lose a, um, a Benny grant, which was through district funding because district is no longer um, as of the end of this year. And um, every year we look at our grant budgets and reallocate where needed. So if one year we were doing, let's say, um, contracting for, I don't know, NDPP programs or something, and we needed that in fees for service, but the next year we need, you know, we want to cover someone 80% other than 40%, those um, figures will change. So that's mainly because of that. So you're, tr you're triaging the fee for services based upon the need of the community, and that may cause a variation in, uh, Correct. in grant funding. Okay, thank yes. you very much. It makes a tremendous amount of sense. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you very much. Uh, now, um, since 164674 has been expended for 2020 overtime year to date due to COVID-19, should more than 55,000 be budgeted for the 2021 overtime line? Yes. Um, well, we believe so. But when we did the budget at that time, we thought 55,000 would suffice. Um, that number can change. Um, and it also depends if we get further grant funding from um, the State Department of Health. Um, we have an RLA out or res resolution that's um, ready to be passed to um, transfer money in to cover the um, negative overtime line for now. Um, but I, I do um, think that we will need more than $55,000. And I guess once we get there, we'll see what we need. Thank you. Um, what does the public health sanitarian position do functionally for your department? So well, public health sanitarian is um, uh, in our division of environmental services and they perform uh, things like uh, inspections, whether they be children's camp inspections, whether they be um, perk testing for um, individuals that are building houses. Um, some of them work on restaurant inspections. Uh, so there's a, there's a variety of services that the public health sanitarians perform. Thank you. And the last question, uh, in, in your fees for services line, please explain what the medical director uh, STD contract is for. Um, it is listed at 65,000. Um, and what if any relationship it has with the STD partnership with St. Peter's listed at 55,000. So, um, you know, formerly we had a medical director here uh, who was an additional physician besides myself in the department that assisted uh, both uh, with clinical services and uh, emergency preparedness and disease response. Um, this was an example of a position that we couldn't fill because the, um, the salary wasn't competitive. So it remained uh, it remained vacant for a couple of years. Uh, we were unsuccessful in filling it. Um, when we uh, decided to uh, relinquish that position, um, we, we had to take into consideration that there were some additional uh, responsibilities that we would need perhaps to contract out for a physician. Uh, we have um, uh, nurse practitioners that do our STD service, but we do need some oversight provided for them. And there are additional uh, needs that we may have for coverage for uh, the clinics when they're not there um, and for signing off sometimes on uh, paperwork, whether it's uh, related to, uh, you know, um, various things in clinical services. So, you know, we, we wanted to give ourselves the opportunity to uh, be able to have that um, service there that we will need in that uh, position's absence. Uh, and um, the partnership with St. Peter's is, is a longstanding uh, partnership um, that we, uh, we have had um, for, for a number of years. Thank you very much. Let's see. I believe that's the last question for tonight. Uh, uh, Dr. Whalen, I just wanna commend you on the fantastic job um, that you have put forward and all of your staff too. 
Um, Albany County has led, uh, I believe, New York State in the way in which we have handled the COVID situation. Um, the, the county executive and um, the, the every morning giving us the reports on where we stand. And now we listen to it, all the fam all families throughout, I believe the county, listen to the reports. So, and we try to live our lives according to, you know, what is being told to us. So we just want you to know that we appreciate you very much and your staff for all of the hard work that you have done. Thank you well, very much. Thank you very much. And I, I definitely agree that, you know, the, we have a staff at second, second to none here at the health department. And I do wanna give kudos to them who do the bulk of this incredibly difficult work. And I do wanna thank all of you as well for your support, because I know that each of you has had an opportunity to kind of advance public health messaging at this time, and you've all been great partners. So I appreciate that. Well, good evening. And again, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Mr. Slatsky. Yeah. Good evening, sir. I'm here. I appreciate you? your, um, I would say your patience, but tonight we have had some real, uh, the, 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 the people that everyone has really been concerned about as far as what has been going on with the county. So we thank you very much. Uh, I will start out by saying, oh, no um, problem. I know that you have received some questions ahead of time and you will as much as possible um, um, uh, bring that bring that out in your presentation. We realize that all of the questions may not be answered tonight, and we look forward to your responses um, later on. And so, right now, we are ready for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll try to be uh, brief, understanding that it's uh, already late, and I do meet with everyone. And thank you for having me, Madam Chair, and and, and the legislature uh, being able to present on be behalf of the nursing home. Uh, it's been a challenging year, like uh, all of the other uh, departments, especially those that we have heard this evening. I mean, everyone, in all honesty, we work together, the health department, uh, mental health, uh, aging in the nursing home. Uh, we're all in this together, and we couldn't do it without the support of the county executive uh, and the legislature. And clearly, uh, the staff at the nursing home, uh, like the other departments have said, uh, they've done just an unbelievable uh, job uh, on a 24-7 basis uh, at the nursing home. Uh, we put together a budget that's very consistent uh, with the years past, uh, being that the nursing home, as you're aware, is uh, concluding its construction project. Really, the budget hasn't changed much. We're just holding our own. Uh, clearly, uh, the coronavirus uh, and its effect on the nursing home, which everyone is well aware of, uh, has had its difficulties um, maintaining an, an increase in census above 170, which we are right now. We're at 170 uh, this morning, uh, but that's okay uh, because eventually uh, this will pass. Uh, the nursing home uh, will complete and should complete the construction project. Uh, right now, we had a meeting on Wednesday. We're looking at the uh, second week in November, which is pretty much on schedule. Uh, the lobby probably wouldn't be completed until the end of November or sometime around Thanksgiving. And knowing what we have to uh, do to get those units ready for opening, including a New York State Department of Health inspection, we're probably looking somewhere around the uh, first or second week in December to actually uh, open uh, the new uh, section, which would be what everyone knows as units A, B, and C, um, including uh, the lobby. Uh, so the construction is going uh, extremely well. Uh, it has had an effect, of course, on everything that we do, uh, having over 100 workers at the nursing home for almost two and a half years now. Uh, dealing with the resident census where we're still running an operation along with all the construction that's going on and then complicated by the coronavirus. So as I said, the staff has stepped up. Uh, I think they've been doing a yeoman's job uh, every single day. 
uh, in maintaining uh, uh, services to our uh, really terrific uh, resident uh, population. Uh, as I said, the budget being submitted is very consistent with uh, years past. Um, we have eliminated uh, at least five or six uh, different uh, positions, uh, as well as lowering some of the uh, existing salaries uh, currently being paid uh, within the 2020 budget going into the 2021 budget, uh, trying to fund the entire a 2% increase that is uh, mandated under the uh, 1199 SEIU and NYSEP contracts uh, to try to keep as much as our budget budget neutral going into 2021. Uh, and I think uh, in many ways uh, we've been Uh, to uh, so um, I did cover uh, what the construction looks like. I mean, the, the front entrance is uh, almost completed, not the internal side, but the external side. Um, and it really is, is, is just magnificent uh, the way everything's coming out. Our driveway will be done next week. We are replacing, uh, and it's half done right now, all the windows and the high rise, uh, which is coming out very well, changed the entire look um, of the um, nursing home. Uh, it should be noted that in, in, in an $80 million project, which, which this is uh, one of the questions uh, was, that were posed was, you know, how are the contingencies going? That's always been an issue uh, for Albany County. And, and uh, we monitored that very closely over the two and a half year period. And I'm happy to say uh, this may change a little bit, but not much. We're almost done with the project that an $80 million, um, you know, construction with the renovation, uh, our contingency spent will probably be somewhere around $1.5 million. And it should be noted uh, that we put aside 3.5 million. And if you remember, we moved out around 2 million uh, out of the uh, contingency to pay for other items uh, such as furnishings. We may need to put some of those uh, dollars back, but um, right now it looks like we're on target and having a contingency spent of around 1.5 million um, in a $80 million project, I think uh, is a credit uh, to all those in, involved uh, in, in the uh, project. Um, the reimbursement um, we're working on and have worked on. Uh, if you uh, look at our previous year's uh, budget, you will note that the capital being reimbursed by the New York State Department of Health was around $7 a day. Uh, we did submit uh, documents uh, to the health department uh, to get immediate reimbursement on money spent uh, over the past year. And we were successful in that effort. And we increased our capital uh, per day Medicaid a dollar amount uh, from the $7 to almost $60 a day. And that's only represents around 50% of the project and only around 20% of the money spent outside the CON for capital expenditures, which will be reimbursed. And that total amount is somewhere around $18 million uh, plus the money spent on the CON uh, itself. So getting a daily increase in your Medicaid rate from $7 a day to $60 a day. And I think when it's all said and done, that capital uh, reimbursement will be more like around $120 uh, a day uh, once uh, everything is submitted and approved. And we have received to date no denials for anything uh, submitted uh, related to uh, the capital uh, expenditure. Um, as you're aware, we, we, we have uh, you know pursued uh, marketing e efforts. I believe the rebranding has really been uh, fabulous, uh, even though uh, we did receive approval uh, with the media company and we have a program in place that we're going to implement. I think right now uh, it's premature, but I'm glad it's in place. We need it in place because they do a lot of other things for us. But right now, until uh, this, so there's a vaccine that people, the meaning the community is comfortable with and the um, public uh, starts understanding the importance or the benefits of congregate living where they believe it's safe, then at that point in time, 
we will uh, look at the best way to spend dollars on media. Uh, I think uh, once the other wings are open and the entire resident population is in the new facility, uh, I think that in itself uh, will be a great marketing tool uh, to the public. And um, uh, last time when we opened uh, the first three wings, we had a huge surge in, in census. And, and I believe uh, the same will happen. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, we'll decide the best way uh, that we could use uh, media uh, on behalf of the, the nursing home. Um, rehabilitation uh, is really the key uh, to good reimbursement and to care for those in our community. But with uh, minimal uh, elective surgeries, um, going into medical centers, and knowing that our rehab department is not open, really, I, it's under construction. It's been closed now for over a year. Uh, all the therapy is done on the units. And uh, we received and, and get direction from our associations as mandated by executive orders and the New York State Department of Health. And uh, being that therapy is done on the units and one-on-one -on -one and then individual resident rooms, again, we can't have congregate therapy. So it's very difficult to push a therapy program. One, because the therapy uh, department, as we know it, is closed and we're decentralized physical and occupational and speech therapy. So um, until uh, the therapy department is open and regulatory requirements change to allow congregate therapy, which in all honesty is not in place right now, uh, therapy in itself or to grow the rehab census uh, also becomes a uh, challenge uh, for us. You will note in the documents uh, submitted to the legislature in my report uh, we have approximately uh, 90 vacancies. Uh, I want to point out that of those 90 vacancies, 70 of those vacancies are within the nursing department and 43, 44 of those 70 vacancies in nursing are for part-time staff members. So while it seems like there's a tremendous amount of vacancies, which there are, uh, the part-timers uh, are not being filled at this time. We're seeking full-time people. And when those slots are filled, uh, the weekend people, which would take place of those that are off every other weekend, the part-time positions are for every weekend, will begin uh, to fill up. And so while it seems like a large number, and it is, we have 70 nursing vacancies, uh, we're filling them as needed, as well as the other 20 vacancies that are in our budget and are needed in, in, because we're running a census of 170. And I monitor the staffing based on census and resident acuity and need so that we stay within budget. So even though we are running a census of 170, we're really on budget. I mean, we're not losing any more money uh, than in past years. And, and we're very, very close uh, to uh, our 2020 uh, projections uh, for our budget uh, because we actually watch uh, our staffing very closely. And I wanna point out that a lot of those positions as in past years, being that they can't be filled or uh, are utilized to fund overtime. And uh, that happens every year because if in an effort uh, to care for our resident population, it's necessary for us to use vacant positions that can't be filled to fund overtime. And uh, that also is monitored uh, very, very um, closely. Um, uh, also, uh, I believe our recruitment efforts uh, are working uh, e extremely well. Uh, I gave those uh, statistics uh, and I put them in my report. So you can see how the media is uh, really assisting us uh, with interviews. I wanna say that I'm happy to say that as I speak today, uh, we have no full-time vacancies for certified nursing assistants on the day shift. Uh, we have only six full-time CNA vacancies on the evening shift and four on the night shift. And that's with a census if we were at 250. So uh, um, really doing extremely well um, in filling our vacant positions. And most of them, as I stated, are part-time positions. Uh, that eventually we will uh, be getting 
and uh, to uh, um, we will also require uh, additional uh, housekeeping personnel. Uh, I don't believe that we need any more full-time positions. And, and I, so therefore I left uh, the full-time positions in our budget as is. We will need part-time positions, which we never used in housekeeping before so that we could maintain the nursing home on a seven day a week basis because the housekeeping, the environmental service staff also get every other weekend off. And they've never used part-timers in that department. So we will be now uh, looking for and have been hiring part-timers so that whatever staff are in that department on a Monday or Tuesday, we will have on Saturday and Sunday to properly uh, maintain uh, the nursing home. All of the equipment in the nursing home will be under warranty for at least another year, at least most of it anyway. And at some point in time, we will reevaluate the maintenance staff uh, to make sure that they have the skill set, uh, the knowledge base to take care of the new equipment, which is quite extensive uh, that has been installed uh, to now operate this nursing home from the boiler system to the chiller system to the electrical system, the new switch gears. It's, it's really pretty intense uh, when you start looking at all the stuff. I already met with the maintenance staff. Uh, they're going to inform me what they believe to be their skill sets and where they see uh, any voids that may be need to be uh, filled to make sure that the nursing home is properly maintained. So that's really uh, my report. Um, I believe it's, it's a good budget. I think that uh, it'll hold its own. Um, I'm, I am a little concerned uh, that IGT, why we will get those payments, uh, they will be reduced um, this year going into next year uh, by a few million dollars. Um, and the nursing home will have to make that up with increased uh, uh, census. And, and of course, we're going to get a new rate. We're going to get a very large rate, which should hopefully take care of the IGT reduction. The good part for the county, you know, the county has to match the IGT in order for us to get the spend down. So being that uh, if, if the IGT got cut by $3 million, it means the county has to contribute $1.5 million less. So that's a good thing for the county budget and the nursing home has to learn to live on its own revenue uh, without any uh, contributions uh, from the county, uh, which we plan on doing. So that sums up uh, my report and, and I'm open uh, to any questions that anyone may have. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, um, um, for your report. Um, I do believe it covered um, most of Mr. Bergdorf's questions. Absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 am, I am impressed. I'm also, I, st I do have to say this, Ms. Mr. Bergdorf, I appreciate um, the way you have used the system as we have asked and, and been a part of the process and submitted your questions. Um, so, but I, Mr. Slatsky, I just want to thank you for that presentation. It, it, you know, the questions that Mr. Bergdor did ask um, was enlightening for all of us and um, answered a lot of questions in regards to the census and to how we were coming along and so forth um, with the construction. Right now, um, Carolyn McLaughlin, I will recognize you. Okay, I'm not sure which, okay. I'm not sure which system is. You're gonna to have to turn one um, one of your um, systems off. Yeah, I got an echo there. Yes, we hear an echo. So it's I, I believe you have your your um, cell phone on, and your iPad. Just use one of them. All right, <clears throat> Mr. Bergdorf. Uh, quick question, Larry. I, I really thank okay, you. For... Um, okay, okay, Carolyn. Mr. Bergdorf, go ahead, please, with your quick question. It, it is a quick question. Um, with the IGT, <laughs> you had indicated, loss of the IGT, you had indicated that our Medicaid rate would, would go up, which uh, uh, I guess is uh, a double-edged sword, because what, the state pays half and we pay half? 
Or... Well, if, if if the if the IGT as an as an example is five million dollars coming down from the feds to the state to us, in order to get the five million, the county needs to come up with two point five million right. for us to yeah. get the five million. Right. So but, if you're going to get two, and so therefore, if you're going to get two million, the county only has to come up with a million versus two point five. Right. Uh, the question I had relates more to the private pay, because you said private pay would have to go up. You know, I have no idea. What do we charge for private pay? And I'm sure that's a loaded question because it depends oh. upon the acuity of, uh, of service. And how does that compare to other nursing homes in the region? It went, if we have an increase, what could it go to? What kind of range? And how does that compare with, you know, I'm not going to mention other name, other facilities by name, but it, it, does it, are, are we competitive? Are we, uh, are, are we a good deal? Or are we at the top of the totem pole? I think right now, uh, in, in understanding that our capital rate was going to go up, I already increased the private pay rate uh, last year uh, so that we're right in the ballpark. Uh, we're not high. We're not low. Uh, we're right in the median. Uh, so to give you uh, an understanding or uh, not understanding, our specific rates are as follows. Um, that if you are in a uh, semi-private room, uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it's really, I, I have to point this out because you just mentioned it, that's really not based on acuity. It's based on the fact whether you have money uh, and you have to pay privately or, or you're on Medicare or Medicaid, and then the system determines how much money we get reimbursed. So if you're in a semi-private room today, it's $400 a day. If you're in a private room in the renovated section, it's $450 a day. And if you're in the private room in the new section it's five hundred dollars a day and that's that's before any changes in the intergovernmental transfer and you have has nothing to do with that one thing has nothing to do with another the um uh, well I, I, maybe i don't understand your question if it whether we get a higher or lower igt currently that is our private rate and we don't plan on changing it in 21 okay and, and is that, uh, are those rates sort of consistent with um, air, other area nursing homes? Where does that- I believe they are now. They weren't, I mean, our, our, our private rate um, used to be, uh, uh, you know, three, two, three, 280 and to $320 a day. Now it's 400 to 500 a day. Yeah. Uh, so we are more, we are now competitive and that's based because of the new construction and we have to now include the capital component. Uh, and, and that also goes for our Medicaid rate. When I started our Medicaid rate was around 175, $179 a day, if you can imagine that. Okay. Um, when the construction project's over, our Medicaid rate will be over $300 a day. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I, I really had no sense of what uh, the economics were. Okay. Carolyn, are you ready? Can you unmute yourself now? We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. We okay, can. I just have I just have one question, and this has been very frustrating for me this evening. I'm going to say that, but anyhow, I just have one question related to the certified nursing assistant career ladder program and the advanced training initiative program that you um, have planned for next year. Um, between those two programs, how many? What's the percentage of your staff that will be being educated on how to provide service um, um, to your residents. 
Well, right now uh, we have uh, seven people who have volunteered uh, for the program. Which program is uh, so that? So that I, I included it in the packet. That's something that eventually uh, I will uh, present uh, to the legislature. Uh, okay. But, but, but the um, we did receive the IG the uh, advanced training initiative money already. We received uh, over four hundred thousand dollars, and it has to be put to recruitment and retention. So I put the plan in there so you, that you could get a briefing on what we would like to do. I, we always talk about at our meetings, uh, recruitment and retention. Uh, this was a, a program uh, put together uh, by uh, the certified nursing assistants and our staff development department. Uh, seven CNAs uh, volunteered to be in the program. They're already in it now with, with the understanding that it's totally voluntary and, and they hope eventually at some point in time to be compensated uh, for their efforts. And that will be a train to trainer program. Oh, so it's initially, it's just, a, it's not, um, there's no additional compensation attached to it during the training. Not at this point in time, because it hasn't been uh, uh, approved by any of the parties. I'm just now okay. presenting it uh, because it was asked of me. Okay. No, I think it's just an exciting uh, program and a way to um, address some of the recruitment needs and the um, retention needs, and also just to provide a career ladder for um, people that have taken on such a noble profession. Thank you. Without a doubt. I'm, I'm finished. Thank you. I'm done, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you, Carolyn. Um, uh, we have one last question for you, Mr. Slavsky, and and this is it. How is your personal service savings tracking this year to the budgeted amount of nine hundred and forty thousand dollars? Is the reduction of two hundred and thirty thousand related to the trend this year, or the removal of positions from the budget? Well, we don't pay physicians. So, which which item is that? You're saying it's over nine hundred thousand. Nine hundred and forty thousand personal, personal savings. Oh, we we just we reduced it to in an effort uh, to fund, um, you know, part of the union increases. And now that the construction project is almost over, we believe that we will be need less dollars for for that line. Thank you so much. Well, <clears throat> I want to thank you for that great presentation again. It was fantastic. Paul, I want to thank you again um, for those questions, um, which allowed his presentation to really answer a lot of questions that were on, I think, uh, <clears throat> uh, many other members' minds too. We appreciate the hard work that you have done this year um, during this pandemic. And we realize that you are charged with some of the most precious gems of many people um, from across the state, as far as that Albany County uh, uh, nursing home is concerned in Shaker Place. So I appreciate that this will be finished before the um, beginning of next year. And this has been a long time in sure. coming. And you have accomplished something that can cannot be overlooked. So we want to thank you for all of your hard work. And, and, and we want you to know that we do appreciate you very much. So well, as uh, I, as well, I, I thank you. We, we all love what we do. Oh, that's wonderful. So as I close and I bid you good night and I will close on a motion to adjourn. Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Like Mr. Mr. Peter, Mr. O'Brien. Second. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good thank night, you. everyone. Tonight. Stay safe. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.